chord progression. You can pretty much sing anything over it. It's like, it's like the instant hit progression. You do the C, the, the D <coughs> to the C9 to the G, and you do this little, this little B minor right here, F sharp major, and then up to the G, so you get that. Here comes the, here comes the part with the B minor. Oh, it's so beautiful. I'm, I'm just gonna have to write lyrics over that. <clears throat> it's so beautiful. It's it's the instant hit progression. I mean, feel free to borrow it. I mean, you can write an instant hit. All right, Scott says. Scott Scott, Kate, and Jacob are here. Hey, guys. Nice to see you. Uh, Trey says, planted my first garden recently after reading a couple of your books. I messed it all up, but I learned a lot. Fantastic. You did it, though. <laughs> Good work. I, I've killed a lot of plants. That's great. You know, uh, it's, it's, what is it, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Better to have planted and failed than never to have planted at all? It's awesome. Hey, Alan, Mary. Uh, Liz says, listening from Connecticut. All right, cool. And Dana, nice to see you. <clears throat> Brandon says, how is the unauthorized crew not jammed together? I know, man. Me and uh, me and Owen, Owen Benjamin, we could write some serious hit songs. They're watching us. The world is flat and they know. You know, I don't know. Black Yellow and Two Cats checking in. All right, awesome. So, uh, Grady says, I love this song. <laughs> it's already a hit. There aren't even any lyrics yet. I mean... All right, so I wanted to thank you guys. Uh, for those of you that went over, free plants for everyone. Here, let's see if I can make this. I'll arrange this like beautifully right here. Here we go. Oh, that's so cool. So Free Plans for Everyone now has its magical 25 reviews. And interestingly, um, they are all five stars so far. So it's just, it's just ripe for a troll to come in and ruin the streak. So if you're a troll, don't ruin my streak. It's so important to me. My entire self-esteem is tied up in those five star reviews. Now... You know, I've got participation trophies my entire life. If this falls off, I'm going to die. I'll, I'll, I'll delete my social media accounts. I've already done that, actually. I'll... I'll leave the U.S. <laughs> so anyhow, we got the, the, the 25 customer reviews, which is really important to, um, to Amazon's algorithms. Um, apparently, that really helps kind of keep the book being recommended and sold so thank you very much I appreciate it and um, if you haven't written a review yet the more reviews the better it keeps boosting it and we're still uh, the, the number one new released in garden gardening and horticultural techniques so thank you all very much for that I'm, I'm very excited <coughs> um, empty gestures yeah <laughs> so uh, nitrogen fixers the uh, I, I keep getting these questions, right? Let me, I'll, I'll show you guys one of these questions. Nitrogen fixers are one of those things that, that keeps coming up because they're so incredibly exciting. Where if you're, if you're a kid in school, you know, everybody's like, George Washington Carver, you know, he, uh, he took those burnt out cotton fields and he planted peanuts. And then the peanuts, the peanuts fix the soil. They restored the soil. They brought back the nitrogen that had all been sucked up by the, the cotton. So I read that when I was a kid. I had the, um, uh, my mom had a, a big collection of biography books for us of all kinds of famous people, you know. And so one of the biographies I read when I was young, which I found particularly interesting because it was uh, gardening related, was a, a biography of George Washington Carver and how <clears throat> peanuts somehow magically fixed 
magically fixed the soil that had been depleted by years of growing cotton. So the, 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 the magic of the peanuts is that peanuts are a legume. They're in the bean and pea family, even though they grow underneath the ground. It's kind of weird. They stick peduncles into the ground. That's a real word. I didn't just make that up. That's real. They put peduncles into the ground. And they grow their little peanuckles on the ends of the, the peduncles. So it's that's all real. It's real. So anyhow, um, on the roots, oh, I wish I could like draw live, you know? I wish I could draw live, that would be awesome. Right, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something here. Let's see, let's see if I've got a something that's like big enough to draw with. Oh, there we go, there we go. Okay. I'm gonna draw live here. I have these I have these books like where I put all these bits of information up, you know. So uh, right here, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a picture. I'm gonna draw a picture live that you can't see. It's so exciting. So anyhow, you've got this beautiful leguminous plant growing above the ground, and it makes these roots underneath the ground. Right? We all understand that there are roots underneath the ground. This is this is real simple stuff here. Roots beneath the ground. So the top of the plant here is getting sunshine. Oh, Mr. Sun. Mr. Sun is up in the sky and he's giving the, the, the sunshine. There we go. There's Mr. Sun. Right? So the sunshine is going to the leaves right here. The leaves are collecting solar energy. Now, the solar energy is being converted through the process of photosynthesis into sugars, uh, along with the carbon dioxide that the plant takes out of the air. Carbon dioxide, by the way, is not a bad thing. Carbon dioxide is plant food. So when you, you get the idea, you know, like we, we hear a lot about carbon dioxide this and carbon dioxide is a terrible pollutant and whatever else. It makes plants happy. So it's not really, carbon dioxide is, bad, is not a bad thing. If we got rid of all the carbon dioxide, that would be a bad thing. Uh, we would all die. So on and around, uh, like just connecting to the roots, I'm going to show you here. There are, oh, I'm going to do a cutaway view. This is going to be so awesome. There is a cutaway view of... But oh, this is so cool. I wish you guys could see what I'm drawing. It's amazing. On the roots of a nitrogen fixer. Okay, here is your, that is weird. I don't know if, they, I don't know if you're gonna understand that or not, but there we go. It's, you know, it's, it's live, it's live drawing. Okay, so right here, you see all these little dots? There's all these little dots on the roots. These are colonies of nitrogen fixation bacteria, rhizobacter, bacteria that live on the roots. Here is a cutaway right here. This is a root going through the center. And then down here, this is one of the nodules. So the nodules are on the roots. And those nodules are receiving, yeah, VX got it, bacteria in symbiosis with the plant, fixed nitrogen in return for sugar. Exactly. The plant is paying the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria. And the nitrogen fixing bacteria are paying the plant. The plant is, they're, they're doing a trade. The plant is giving them sugars for them to feed on. In return, they are taking atmospheric nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is a very non-reactive gas. You know, they preserve things in liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen is very, in its, in its natural state, is very non-reactive. It doesn't really want to do anything. But when it is put into certain combinations, it is, it, it can be quite reactive. You can make beautiful explosives out of nitrogen. Oh, I just got demonetized. Oh no, no, I probably didn't. Probably nobody's listening, right? So I'll, wait, I'll draw how you do. No, I won't. I know how to do it. No. Murotic acid, sawdust. Okay, no, no, we're not gonna do that. How you re, no, no. But anyhow, nitrogen can be very reactive when it is in specific forms that plants can use, fertilizer form. So the plants, what the, what the bacteria does is it has the capability of taking nitrogen from the air that is in the soil. There's a lot of air in the soil, air pockets everywhere. 
and they're able to take atmospheric nitrogen and fix it into a form that the plants can use as fertilizer. So the plant, in turn, grows bigger and stronger, and it gathers more sunlight, and it makes more sugar. So if you pull up a healthy bean plant, a pea plant, a mimosa tree, if you pull up one of these plants, you can actually see, if the roots are pulled out carefully enough, you can see the little nodules on the roots. Somebody said to me the other day, now, how do you know that they aren't, you know, root knot nematodes? It was actually, it's actually quite simple. I'll have to draw another picture. Root knot nematodes make twisty, ugly, distorted lumps into the roots. So I am going to draw that. Uh, uh, let's see, root, and I'm gonna write root nitrogen fixing root nodules. So if you have the root nodules, they generally are, they're mostly round and they are connected off of the kind of the sides of the root and they have they have kind of a pretty it's like a stripy shape to them and sometimes they can be the same size as root knot so you see here uh, root nodules that's nitrogen fixing bacteria type nodules over here is root knot like if you have nematodes that is actually a condition where the nematodes sting the roots get into the roots bury themselves in the roots and chew their way through and the plant tries to react by going around, trying to get around it. And so it's constantly growing around this damaged area. So you have this twisted, knotty, nasty thing. And it is like the, the root itself is a knotted mess. Whereas if it's the nitrogen fixing bacteria, they make these little balls on the sides of the roots that you can actually kind of just brush them off. They're, they're like a little colony that lives right there on the sides. So it is nitrogen in a yeah in a solid or usable form so i don't have a huge amount of um uh you know chemistry knowledge but i have pulled up enough plants and looked at them and and I, i've seen how how it works and i've done enough reading that i can i can give you a basic explanation it's it's really it's actually quite awesome the whole thing it's it's a very complicated design the way it all works together because the the nitrogen fixing bacteria need those trees and the trees and the plants need those bacteria they work together they have to kind of both be there so let's let's take a look at some of the questions i got here somebody asked me do peas have to be inoculated before planting to become nitrogen fixers this is a good question because you will see inoculants sold that are for specific species right so you'll get clover with inoculant or you'll get you know beans there's bean and pea inoculant that sort of thing mm -hmm. if the bacteria are not there in the soil yes they need the inoculant there have been times where plants have been planted outside of their natural range outside of where the bacteria live and they have failed to thrive until they were inoculated this is basically an inoculant is a powdered, like a powder mixture of the bacteria. You put them, you put them together with the beans and a little bit of non-chlorinated water. You swish all your beans or your seeds around in it and then you plant them and now the bacteria are living all over the outside of the seed coat. So when it sprouts, they immediately start growing onto the roots and they do their thing and their plants are really happy. However, I have not had to inoculate any of my nitrogen fixing species because where I lived uh, in Florida, there were weeds everywhere and a lot of the weeds were nitrogen fixers and a lot of the bacteria carry over to other species. So I had, I had black medic, I had um, <clears throat> various like little climbing peas that were wild, these little things that make these sticky burrs that stick all over your socks. There were all these different members of the bean and pea family that were already in the yard. So no matter where I planted um, beans or peas or nitrogen fixing trees, they always did really well. So I knew if you planted a bunch of beans and they did poorly, you would not be able to get, uh, get you know, uh, that you would have, you would just know that you had bad 
they probably the, the bacteria were not in the soil. So in that case, you want to inoculate. You have new ground and it's been grass forever and there's no, you don't see any nitrogen fixing plants for, for miles. Um, there's not a bad idea to put an inoculant on. So I don't, I don't normally have to. My new land had all kinds of little nitrogen fixing beans and stuff like wild beans and pea type plants. Little, you could see they make these little pods. They have the little trifoliate leaves, and you know it's like okay, these are these are like little tiny nitrogen fixers everywhere. Plus the trees that are up above are probably some species of albizia. When I was digging the yam beds that you can see in the last couple of videos I did, the the yam beds are loaded with roots from those trees. I'm hacking and cutting these giant roots out, but in between those giant roots, there are tons of little tiny roots that have root nodules all over them. As I'm turning the ground, I'm seeing this matted network of little tiny roots and root nodules everywhere. So that's all available nitrogen to the next crop. And if I plant beans and peas there, I have no worries. I'm sure that they're going to produce. But an inoculant is cheap insurance if you don't know. Here is uh, another question related to a specific legume. <clears throat> El Hardin uh, Perdido says, David, why do you always use pigeon peas uh, opposed to other legumes for nitrogen fixing? I only ask because they're so hard to find in Houston. The reason is, is that I use them because they fit the climate. They are a short term perennial species that last a few years. They make a lot of biomass. They fix a lot of nitrogen. They, they grow in poor soil. They grow under drought conditions. Um, I can chop and drop them, but they work really well in this climate. When I was in North Florida, I grew pigeon peas multiple times, but they always failed to make me much in the way of peas because we would get to winter and the frost, they would start blooming with the day cycle. <clears throat> and you get to the day, you know, the day length changes and that's when they start to bloom. It's getting, you know, the days are getting shorter, they start blooming and then they would all freeze off. Like they just were not well suited to North Florida. I only got a handful of peas, if that. And it was completely not worth it. Um, they might be worth it for a biomass plant. You know, you just plant them in between. You know, they're going to freeze down. Fine. You fix some nitrogen. You held the soil. But they were not a good crop. So um, that's why I use pigeon peas. Wherever you are, there is almost certainly a nitrogen fixer that will work for you. If you're farther north and you want a good long-term nitrogen fixer, um, the uh, autumn olive works very well. It's Eliagnus. That is not a that is not a uh, leguminous species. It's not a bean and pea family, it's different. But that was used to restore old messed up mining sites. Like as a mining reclamation plant, it was planted all over the place. It's become kind of invasive, but it makes a small edible fruit. So, you know, it's got multiple uses. It's nitrogen fixing and it makes a fruit. Even farther north, you can grow uh, Siberian pea shrub, um, you know, I just talked to a guy in Australia who's growing tree lucerne. That's another one. <clears throat> um, there's, there's probably a nitrogen fixer wherever you are. If you go, you know, uh, there's often like clover mixes that you can buy. You can just buy clover seed. That's great. Clover's great. There's different, like the, the red clover and the white clover, depending on how far north you are, you plant one or the other. I don't remember which one goes which way. I never uh, was in a place to grow much clover except for Tennessee. So you can plant alfalfa further north. Alfalfa is a fantastic nitrogen fixer. Even the, uh, you know, the industrial farmers, what they do is they grow soybeans in between their crops of corn. So you've got the, the corn crop, which takes a lot of nitrogen from the soil, and they follow it with a soybean crop. And the soybean adds nitrogen back to the soil, which means when they put corn crop, the next corn crop in, they don't have to add as much fertilizer because the Soybeans have left some in the ground for it. The old uh, Indian method of the three sisters garden. You have your corn, you have your beans, and you have your pumpkins. The pumpkins crawl along the ground. Pumpkins are squash. <clears throat> you have beans that climb the corn stalks. The corn takes nitrogen, but it acts like a trellis for the beans. The beans fix nitrogen and they climb the corn and then the squash or the pumpkin shades the ground and keeps the ground a little cooler, acts like a ground cover and a weed suppressant. So, you know, it's, it's a nice system. But when you have a nitrogen fixer, no matter what it is, it can be a short-term nitrogen fixer, like if you're doing annual beds, 
you can you can go to the store you can go buy dry beans dry lentils dry chickpeas that sort of thing um, alfalfa seeds if you want to do some else you're sprouting or whatever you can plant those things into garden beds that are not currently being used and then when you're ready to use them just turn that stuff into the soil or throw some mulch down or cut it throw some mulch down on top of it plant into the middle of it and you have added a bunch of nitrogen to the ground not to mention the fact that you've also added biomass to the ground all the roots are going to rot the nitrogen is going to be added that they were creating plus the tops will rot release the nitrogen that is in the tops of them so you know remember the whole plant is full of nitrogen too and the nitrogen fixers are actually really good at making nitrogen fit rich material so like your alfalfa is really rich in nitrogen it's high in protein protein breaks down into nitrogen so it's a nitrogen fixer it makes its own nitrogen stores a bunch of it in the leaves when you cut the leaves boom they fall on the ground they add nitrogen to the ground they also add whatever other minerals they picked up plus some carbon the roots at the same time are dropping all those nodules beneath the ground so you're adding nitrogen from the top and from the bottom if you're doing a food forest system you have trees that you deliberately plant such as a black locust you um, maybe a polonia you have these trees you plant them and you can cut them again and again and again you can do a pollard Jeff Lawton likes to do his pollards at about six foot so just over your head you cut the tree off and you drop all of those nitrogen fixed you know those those nitrogen rich leaves and branches you chop them up and you throw them around your fruit trees at that point you've cut it and it's going to drop some nitrogen beneath the ground and at the same time you're dropping the nitrogen and mulch from above so there's your long term you use perennial long-term trees in a system so George Washington Carver had his annual peanuts and then his annual cotton you turn the peanuts under you plant some more cotton and maybe you plant some sweet potatoes then you plant some more peanuts you plant some cotton put some more peanuts in plant some sweet potatoes whatever you know you have a cycle where you're adding the nitrogen to the soil by growing the peanuts and then you know you plant something next but in a food forest system you're actually growing long-term trees and chopping them and cutting them over and over and over again eventually your fruit trees maybe after five or six years have gotten much bigger and you can just cut the nitrogen fixers to the ground they basically get shaded out and they die but they've done their work they grow really fast they make a lot of nitrogen above the ground they're storing it in the leaves below the ground the bacteria are creating it on the roots so <coughs> you've got it all over the place uh, let me show you this here here's another one I'm gonna take a few questions first I'll show you this in a minute Jake White says don't plant autumn olive extremely invasive some states banned it altogether yes that's true um, but it's also a very useful species so I planted it in Florida it's not particularly invasive in Florida VX says the bacteria are in the soil normally yes generally they are unless you have degraded soil you don't have a good polyculture on the ground like I said if it's if it's a lawn that's just been growing grass for a long time and you don't you know there may not be any bacteria left there to wake up <clears throat> Christopher says, hello, everyone. I found this because I'm reading Grow or Die. Welcome. Nice to see you, Christopher. John B. says, what happens if you grow beans hydroponically where the bacteria can't get in? That's a good question. You may have to give them their nitrogen through the mix. <coughs> uh, let's see here. Zuzu said, just purchased your new book on Amazon. Thank you very much, Zuzu. I appreciate it. Good evening, Sue. All right, so Della Luna says, hey, from Uruguay, how can I get the online book if I can't install Kindle? Will not come true customs in paperback version, neither. Della Luna, write me a email. I am david at floridafoodforests.com. We'll see what we can get you. <clears throat> hey, Finca, nice to see you too. Sasquatch Saga says, don't know why, but whenever I plant beans in my soil, they pop up and do nothing much at all. They may be short. They may You may have soil that uh, doesn't have the proper bacteria in it for them. Uh, another possibility is that they're, they're suffering from another nutritional deficiency. Uh, are, are, if there is, you have to check, too. 
if there's any distortion in the new growth that grows, then you're dealing with like an herbicide issue where there's something in the ground because beans are very, very sensitive to the long-term herbicides like uh, the amino pyrrolids. <coughs> VX says, put more carbon on the ground and the level of nitrogen will drastically rise. It, it depends. <laughs> I mean, if you put a bunch of carbon in the ground, uh, you will lead to a feeding frenzy of bacteria which will consume all the nitrogen for a period of time. It will eventually be re-released. Lawrence, the truth says, what do you think about crushed oyster shells in your soil? I think it's a great idea. I have added them to my garden beds before. Crushed, crushed shells are a good slow release source of calcium. <clears throat> Sasquatch Saga says, Tommy's do great, but not beans. Yeah, it's probably a nitrogen fixing issue then. Because uh, tomatoes are actually usually more work than beans, and they're also very sensitive to herbicides. So let me show you this other one here. This is kind of an interesting email I got. I asked her if I could share it too, so I'm not just like randomly sharing people's emails. This is not this is not Hillary Clinton's server here. That you know, this is not hacked. Uh, hello, David. My husband recently bought Compost Everything and Survival Gardening. I read them both. And they were really informational and helpful. I've also watched several of your shows on YouTube and have started amateur gardening. My three-year-old daughter now thinks composting is something normal people do. I recently asked a gardener if crepe myrtles were nitrogen fixers, and he told me, yes, the seed capsules are used for mulch and or a compost additive to help raise the nitrogen level. Question, is this true? No, that's like the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, other than somebody that told me today, ha, you eat eggs? One egg is like as bad for your heart as five cigarettes. That's not true because I've, 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 I've done tests side by side. I definitely feel worse after five cigarettes than one egg. It is science. The science is settled. Crepe myrtles, if you guys don't know, crepe myrtles are an ornamental tree that's grown in the south from about Virginia, Tennessee, south. It's a, uh, it's a tree from China. It's somewhat cold hardy, but not, not super, super cold hardy. Beautiful tree, but it makes these little, these little capsules, um, and it's really, really popular in Florida. It's like planted everywhere. Uh, it's a good drought tolerant, pretty tree, um, but it, it is not a nitrogen fixer. After reading this, I'm like, I have never heard of crepe. It's not a leguminous tree. That doesn't mean it's not a nitrogen fixer, but it's not a leguminous tree. So it's it's not an obvious nitrogen fixer. So I, uh, I, I did a little more reading. I'm like, there's no way it's a nitrogen fixer. No, there's no information on, on it fixing nitrogen. But beyond that, the seed capsules... They're, they're like this big. I mean, you would have to go and gather a bunch of them off the tree. It's bizarre. So this is a really strange, that's a really strange thing to say. <laughs> I don't know where you get this idea. There's not enough to use mulch. There's probably a couple of handfuls of seed capsules on a tree after it produces. No, I, I don't know where you got this idea. This is bizarre unless the, you know, the plants got crossed. <clears throat> so no, that's not true. <laughs> Uh, and she says, and this might be silly, but is that how nitrogen fixers work? I guess I thought they magically infused the dirt around them with nitrogen somehow. Do you need to chop and drop to get into the ground? This is a, this is a good question. Do you need to chop and drop plants to get nitrogen in the ground? <clears throat> I have read some of the permaculture guys and they have said no. Now, if you're going to go with the, the three sisters garden, the plant is, is going to be growing right you got a bean growing at the base of the corn the idea is that it's fixing nitrogen for the corn what if it's only fixing nitrogen for itself that greedy little bean it doesn't want to share with no corn no it wants to fix it all for its own self maybe it's doing that uh if if it's true that you don't have to cut them first so there's there's mixed information on this some people say that yeah they do add extra nitrogen to the ground around them uh, and some of the literature says no, they have to be they have to be tilled under to make a difference. The the idea in the food forest nitrogen fixers is that every time you cut the top of the tree, you get the roots dying back beneath. So 
the when the roots die back beneath, there are a bunch of nitrogen nodules on there. The tree is going, oh, I don't need all this root mass now. This is too much root mass. I have a small amount of leaves to maintain. I don't need all this root mass. So it drops a bunch of root mass in proportion to the fact that you cut the, the top of it down. So it's going to drop the nitrogen underneath the ground, uh, you know, along with it. So if you don't cut it, is it putting nitrogen in the soil? Probably somewhat. I'm, I'm going to say probably because I don't know for sure. I've never measured it, you know, like you would have to check a piece of ground that has a nitrogen fixer and check a piece of ground that doesn't and do regular soil samples. And you also, I mean, if you did the soil sample too, and you cored a piece of the soil out, you're going to get some of the roots and some of the nodules when you do it. So you're going to read higher nitrogen. You just have to, you, but <clears throat> you've damaged the tree and you've took some of the nitrogen. It, are other trees able to get amongst the roots and steal some of that nitrogen? Probably, probably a little bit. And every time the plant is stressed and it drops a few roots here and there, it decides to grow over here or grow over there, it's going to be adding a little bit of nitrogen. So my bet is, is it's adding a little bit. It's also adding nitrogen because of the leaf drop from above. It get, you get a drought, tree gets a little bit stressed, it drops some leaves, those rot into the ground, they add more nitrogen. Plants do that over time. They're always dropping a little bit of debris. So they do magically infuse the dirt around them with nitrogen through the power of science. Uh, and if you want serious nitrogen, yes, you have to chop and drop it, but it's probably leaking a little bit. So anyhow. Um, it's really, some of these things are, are kind of hard, you know, to figure out. <clears throat> and some of it, you know, I read information regularly and I see the permaculture guys saying things, you know, uh, do I know that that's the best, best method possible? Do I know that for sure it's really going to work? Well, I know that, uh, I know that you can, you can feed the ground with the tops of nitrogen fixers. I know that I am creating mulch and I'm feeding the soil microbiology. I've seen soil improve because of biomass being dropped on the ground. I've definitely seen a improvement there. So I do know that it works. Do I know that it works completely the way everybody says it does? You know, or are people like borrowing information and repeating it? It's quite possible. You know, how much root gets dropped off when you prune the top of a tree? I don't know. Somebody's probably figured it out. Um, but that's a hard test to do. You know, how much how much root mass did it just drop? How do you tell? What do you do? Grow it in a glass box? You know, grow it side grow it sideways in a glass box that's like this wide, and then and then figure it out. Maybe. <laughs> really, all I can do is is plant the nitrogen fixers, and and observe how things do around them over time. I can't you know trying to get complete data. Does it do this? And does it? Do you have to chop it to make a difference? It's hard to tell. You'd have to plant two food forests, one without nitrogen fixers and one with nitrogen fixers, and then try to see the difference, and then not cut one set of nitrogen fixers at all. Maybe plant three food forests, one with a set of nitrogen fixers that you cut, one with a set you don't cut, and then a, you know, a control group that has no nitrogen fixers whatsoever. And then, of course, you have to make sure that uh, the soil is exactly the same in all three. Yeah, it just gets to be like, whatever. Just cut it and drop it. It's probably doing something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know that the top of the tree is loaded with nitrogen. When you cut it and put it on the ground, it feeds the ground, it feeds the tree. That's good enough for me. I know that a lot of these trees that are nitrogen fixers are also very good livestock fodder because they're high in protein. So they give a lot of value uh, in protein value to the plants. Alfalfa, um, you know, your Glaricidia sepium, Lucana leucocephala, that sort of thing. So. Flyer of a Pilgrim says, the best way to think about it, I think, is to feed the soil, not the plant. Maintain the soil, make it healthy, the plants will get what they need. Yeah, I agree. And unhealthy, unhealthy plants, unhealthy soil leads to unhealthy plants, and unhealthy plants attract diseases and issues. They just, you can just see, like, if they're skinny and they don't do well from the beginning, they just, like, bugs come to them and eat them. It's like they just, everything just comes and kills it, you know? That's like that one weak kid or that one weird kid in class and all the other kids beat him up. It's mean. You got one chicken that's got a problem, everything comes and beats it to death. Horrible. Uh, you 2 dodo says, your thoughts on thornless honey locust tree, nitrogen fixer, chop and drop, is it worth growing? I like the honey locust for the edible pods. I like the 
the wood of them is very good. The jury is out on whether or not it's a nitrogen fixer. Bill Mollison thought it was. Some of the permaculture guys think it is. And other people say, no, it doesn't fix nitrogen. It does make a decent amount of, of leaf cover, and it doesn't shade heavily. I had one in my old food forest, and uh, I didn't do much with it. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty tree. Probably not as good as... Uh, growing black locust <clears throat> unless you're going to eat the you know if you're going to eat the pods that's nice to have those pods and some of them actually have very good pods Finka says I like the tool shed you built gonna do something similar yeah it looks kind of like an outhouse I had a four by six piece of thick plywood and I said that'll be the base I'll make a little tool shed so that was my that's my tool shed so I could store tools over there when I'm in between working Jan says, David, my avocado tree's leaves look like it has chlorosis. I'm not sure that's what it is, though. What should I do? Could any other deficiency cause yellow leaves with green veins? Yeah, magnesium, iron, or nitrogen uh, can cause that. Cool soil can cause that. Too much water can cause that because the, the roots are becoming less efficient. And high pH, possibly super low pH, but usually it's high pH, like too too high a pH, the plant is unable to take the nutrients it needs out of the soil. So for a quick fix, I would take, I would try putting some uh, Epsom salts around it. Take a cup or two cups of Epsom salts, go around the, go around the, uh, the drip line and water it in and see if that helps within a week or two. If not, you can spray the leaves with a, uh, a fertilizer, I mean like Dynagro, something like that, something that will give it uh, a range of micronutrients. Steve Solomon actually recommended Dynagro to me. Over time, I've, I've become less... Uh, I used to actively dislike all chemical type fertilizers, but then I've had so many problems with herbicide contamination and stuff, uh, and seen so many gardens wrecked by using organic fertilizers I'm thinking, is it really better to take slaughter wastes or composted chicken manure? I find out there's arsenic in chicken feed. There's uh, long-term herbicides that last for years that's in hay that's being fed to all the animals, so it's coming through in the manures. Or is it better to get some product that has a bunch of balanced elements in it that has been tested by a lab and it doesn't have any herbicides in it? Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm like, yeah, wh whatever go get a, a gallon of Dynagro, at least they're getting all the elements they need without some sort of industrial big agriculture toxin. It's not an ideal world. But you can give them, you can foliar feed them with something like that. Uh, or you can, you can foliar feed them um, with like some, some diluted urine or compost tea is nice. Very something, you know, very light like that. Uh, and see if it greens it up. It usually will. I used to use just compost tea. I threw a whole bunch of stuff in a barrel. I didn't. I haven't used the the chemical stuff very often. But um, after talking with Steve Solomon and hearing about some of the results he had with uh, the various suspended elements like that, I'm like yeah, you know, whatever. If you want to use it, use it. Um, <clears throat> but if you take, you know, if you make my anaerobic compost tea, like I have in compost everything, you put a bunch of leaves. Uh, into a barrel. You can throw some fish guts in there. You can throw some kitchen scraps or whatever in there. Just throw everything in there. Let it sit in water and rot for a while. It smells horrible. You thin it out with some water and use it as a foliar feed. Plants love it. They go crazy. They turn dark green. <laughs> it's it's crazy. So, B. Grum says, I ended up using milorganite. Yeah, milorganite. Uh, milorganite. The problem with milorganite is not... The concept is very good. The concept of taking the city sewage, putting it into a useful, you know, composting it down, basically they, they kind of cook it down and they make pelletized fertilizer out of it. That's a great idea. The downside is all the trash that goes down the, the sinks and everything. Think of the garages in Milwaukee or a hair salon or whatever else. All the, all the chemicals that get dumped on the toilet and there's a lot of heavy metals. So milorganite, uh, from what I've heard, is is way too high in in various contaminants and heavy metals. It the 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 grass may not notice it, but I wouldn't want it in my garden. You know. 
Karthik says, hi, I'm from India. Hey, other side of the world, welcome. VX says, for iron, just put some rusted iron in the ground or via spray. Yeah, I've heard it. The, the rusted iron in the ground may or may not work. I'm not sure if it if it works as well in just like iron oxide form like that. I don't know. There, you know, there, there's different forms of iron that are more or less absorbable. <clears throat> Jan says, thanks, David. It's probably high pH. I'll try what you suggested. I didn't think about fetid swamp water. I have a 55-gallon barrel of it. Yeah, it works well. It, it'll full your feed nicely. <laughs> um, and if you do have high pH, it helps to throw compost and mulch around the area. Uh, it, can, it can help buffer the pH a little bit. And if you can get some elemental sulfur, they make little pelletized elemental sulfur or just the dust and just dust it around the area, that will feed uh, various sulfur bacteria in the soil, which in turn make sulfuric acid, which lowers the pH just a little bit at a time, but it'll lower, it'll lower the pH. That's what blueberry farmers do. Sasquatch Saga says, wonder if iron is the issue for citrus yellowing bad next to another one, vibrant green though. Sometimes that is too much water with citrus. They are really unhappy. No, it's just called elemental sulfur, Jan. Um, look for like blueberry sulfur. That's what you look for. If iron is the issue, it could be. Sometimes it's iron. Um, but sometimes it's that the roots get flooded. I had a friend who couldn't figure out why his citrus kept turning yellow and they would suffer and then they would green up a bit and then they would get really yellow and they would stay yellow. They just didn't look good. And he figured out that it was linked to when it was raining and when it wasn't. They would start to recover when it was drier. And then when the rain came, he had dug a nursery area and the slope changed a little bit and it was going, the nursery area was washing down to the citrus trees. The citrus trees were at the bottom and the the slope had changed a little bit so the trees were getting water directed at them all through florida rain so all through the summer when it was pouring rain the trees started to turn yellow and they got less and less happy and then they'd start to recover a little bit in the winter and then they would turn yellow again and he just redirected the water they don't like a lot of water so they that yeah okay he says you had heaps of rain the last few months here that will cause chlorosis they do not like that Karthik says, we had sandy soil. I did soil tests showing less organic matter. That may not be bad, Karthik. Um, there are different soil types, and different soil types are capable of carrying more or less amounts of organic matter. Sand generally does not carry a lot of organic matter, and that's just the way it is. You can load more into it, but it'll drop out over time, and it'll balance out at a normal level. So some plants, like you know, some soils like clay can hold more organic matter and they'll hold on to it for longer but with with sand it just generally goes out there's sort of a a stasis level of organic matter that above you have to just keep shoveling it on you know yes i know rusted iron equals iron oxide i just don't know if iron oxide is the best form for them to absorb <clears throat> I was a, uh, I went to art school, so um, we actually had a, an oxide, iron oxide paint. One of the colors in my, my, my paint collection is just, it's oxide red, and it's just, it's basically just rust. <laughs> Flyer of Pilgrim says, our well water is very high in iron. We suspect that our poor results last year may be related to the high iron content since it was the first year we used. Yeah, that may be. It's possible. The, we should not absorb too much iron. Actually, men tend to absorb, men, men hold on to more iron than women do. Women actually have a cycle once a month where they actually lose some iron. So women are more prone to anemia. However, they are less prone to accumulating too much iron. Men often accumulate too much iron over time and excess iron leads to various health problems. A lot of us who eat a decent amount of, of red meat and eat a lot of the food really is also, it's supplemented with iron. They put supplemental iron sprays in a lot of stuff. So you get too much iron in your system and it, it causes issues. My friend, uh, Petey Mangan, who's a nutritionist, he wrote a book called Dumping Iron. And he talked about how guys and girls to a lesser extent, but sometimes they accumulate too much iron over time and the body can't get rid of it and it leads to other health issues 
hard to get rid of. Interestingly though, if you give blood, it takes some of the iron out of your system because iron is bonded to, you know, it's in your, it's in your blood cells, it's in the hemoglobin. So that's, you know, it, it bonds with the oxygen and it helps carry it through. This is why, um, you know, we have, we have red blood and lobsters have blue, blue green, you know, because they have, they have a similar mechanism, but it's copper instead of iron. So the iron leads to that red, red, red blood. And if you give blood, you lose some, you lose some of that iron. Every time you give blood, I gave blood uh, a few weeks ago because a friend of mine was in big, big trouble and needed, needed extra blood. So I went down and donated on his behalf to see if we could get him out of the hospital. And, uh, you know, like that first day I felt shaky, but I felt great afterwards, you know, a couple days later. It actually, it rejuvenates your system to give blood. So, Iron Maiden, yeah. <clears throat> Pastor Don said, our well water is high in iron. I had a house guest who said the shower smelled like blood. Yeah, that's, you know, if I had a house guest that said something like that, yeah. The shower smells like blood. There's chauffeur in the sink. Shower smells like blood. Psycho. All right, so Zoe says, hey, you're the reason for this first gardener making her own compost. Well, good for you. Good work. Let's, let's give Zoe a round of applause. Very good. Good job on the compost. Boom, compost everything. Hey, thank you very much. Gummer Bear sends a $20 super chat. He's just monetized this stream. Our first super chat of the night. Thank you very much. He says, finally caught a live stream. Love the vids and have bought a couple of books. Keep on keeping on, brother. Very glad to have a bear here. Thank you very much. Very cool. Shower smells like blood. <laughs> He bought a couple of books and sent me a $20 super chat. God bless you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and welcome aboard. Uh, Karthik, you can send me an email. That's better. David at Florida Food, Florida, Florida Food Forests dot com. <clears throat> Della Luna says, we mixed in 28 duck carcasses and feathers with their chop and drop acacia leaves in the wood chepper last week. Pete Canaris meets Fargo. <laughs> oh, that is so awesome. Duck carcasses and feathers with chop and drop acacia leaves in the wood chipper. That is some serious compost. Um, you know, meat, bones... There is a ton of great material in there for the compost pile. Great material for the plants to feed on. They absolutely love it. Um, I planted a grapefruit tree over a dead rooster. It loved it. Awesome. Finka says he got an e-string finally. Hey, why don't you do a uh, why don't you do a traditional <laughs> do a, a traditional Aztec version of the good song on the guitar? I know you're not Aztec. I just it just cracks me up. Do it, yes, you know something something traditional. Dead cats, shredded duck compost. That's hard to beat. Um, that that's some seriously good composting. Uh, yeah, hey, if you do, if anybody does a version of the good song, I will I will put it in a video and give you credit. Like you know. I went to see David, David the Good, we listened to Porter's Head, and drank spiced rum. See, it's just C, A minor, F, and G. So do your own version of it. You can make your own lyrics up. I don't even, I don't even think anybody's heard the entire song. It doesn't matter. Um, go for it. As long as you get that, I went to see David thing in there. I mean, I, I have a friend of mine who's a harpist. I've, I've really wanted her to do a harp version of it. I think it would be heavenly. Um, and then Constantina, who's been taking care of her dad, um, he, she is a very good pianist. So, oh, that's a very good question. V. Grum sends a... 
Bigram says, what trees would you recommend in Central Florida? It seems like we are between zones. Yes, you are absolutely between zones, which presents you with some opportunities and with some difficulties. <clears throat> um, first of all, peaches do very well there, uh, but stick to the Tropic Beauty peach. Tropic Beauty, Tropic Snow, those two are your best peaches for that area. They're very good peaches. You don't really need any other variety, but if you can get if you can get Tropic Beauty uh, seeds and plant a bunch of seedlings, they'll do well too. They're, and it's a cheaper way to do it. Like this time of year, you find somebody that's got a peach tree growing in your area, in the Orlando area. They have some at the Orlando Extension Office. Um, that is, they, they start really easily from seed and they cost you nothing and they'll, they'll produce the, the fruit in Central Florida in like two months. Peaches. Um, you can also grow pears. You're right at the bottom of the pear range. Pineapple pear is the most seems to be the most disease resistant variety. You could also try Orient, which is a good pollinator for pineapple, but it doesn't. It's not as good a pear. Um, loquat trees do really well in that area. Uh, if you can get an improved loquat, it's actually a very good fruit. And sometimes you'll get two crops in a year. Cherry of the Rio Grande is a cherry variety. It's not a real cherry, but it tastes just like a Bing cherry. It's actually a Eugenia. That's, that's a really good cherry alternative for that area. Cherry of the Rio Grande is what it's called, like the river in Mexico. Um, <clears throat> another really good one is uh, the Catley Guava, also known as the Strawberry Guava. It's a little more cold tolerant than the tropical guava. The tropical guava will grow in your area, but it needs a little bit of shelter because it tends to freeze down in the winter. It doesn't like going below freezing at all. So if you get a freeze, you're going to lose the top of it unless it's in a protected location. Uh, I've seen them growing very well in Polk County, but that's a little further south. So uh, you're right on the edge for the real guava, but the Catley guava does a nice job. The pineapple guava is good and it's really cold hardy but it's uh it, it's slow and it's better to get an improved variety sometimes they're just so slow it's like is this thing ever gonna fruit they just bother me the suriname cherry is a good one go for the black variety if you can get that it's the it's the less common one it's uh it's fruit it's, it's fruit tastes better it's sweeter and it doesn't have as much of a varnish flavor the red ones have a little bit of a varnish flavor they're still decent but they're not great like the black ones are great, great fruit. Um, you can also grow some varieties of apples. You can experiment with it. If you look up the Couple Creek Nursery, they have a bunch of tropical varieties of apples and there's some experimentation you can do with apples, but it's marginal. It's gonna be, it's gonna be hit or miss and it's gonna be experimentation. The, my favorite tree for that area would probably be the Japanese persimmon tree. You get yourself a Fuyu persimmon or a Hachia. Both of those do very well in that area. And beyond that, you can zone push. You can grow um, key limes. If you grow them up against a south-facing wall, you can grow coffee against the south-facing wall or star fruit against the south-facing wall out in the open. Some years it'll freeze. Some years you know, it may die. So that would be my, my recommendations to get you started. I've also got more stuff in the, um, the little booklet I did, Create Your Own Florida Food Forest, that's on... Uh, Amazon. I've got a bunch of tree species recommendations. Richard sends a $2 super chat and says, if you have YouTube Red, you can get some free cash. I am on YouTube Red. I don't know exactly how it works, but thank you. No more spice rum. Yeah, do an Aztec accent, whatever that sounded like. Karthik says, from India, we use liquid mixture of cow dung plus cow urine plus jaggery. I don't know what jaggery is. Through drenching, this can avoid virus attack on plants. What's your opinion on this? I think you're probably, I think it's fine. I think you're feeding the soil biology. Uh, cow manure is very, is very good. There's, um, there's, a good. there's a good mixture of organic matter and nitrogen and minerals and bacteria in it. It's great stuff. So I think... I don't know if that will help you avoid a virus attack, but it will make for healthy plants, which which should help. Sugar, okay, yes. 
Yeah, you it would it would feed the sugar would feed the uh, the soil fungi. The fungi like to eat those carbohydrates. You can actually put grain into the ground to feed the the carbohydrates, like cooked rice. You know, there's people that have put cooked rice into their beds on purpose because they're trying to bring in the fungi that are going to kill some of the bad bacteria. I don't know how it's going to help with viruses, but hey, you know. <clears throat> Yeah, human urine is very good for MPK, 11, 2, 3, plus amino acids. It's very good. It has all the trace minerals in it, too. Pastor John said, I missed the first part. Did you talk about how close to plant nitrogen fixtures to bananas? No, I didn't, but it's not going to hurt. Sugar will feed bacteria. Yeah, but it also feeds the, it also feeds the fungi. And it feeds yeasts. <laughs> I would just plant, plant the bananas, plant the nitrogen fixtures right next to them. Bananas will push them out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I look like you're chopping and dropping on those bananas. Make sure you get your bananas some potassium too. They like that. Finka says, I'm debating on what soil I should use for my mango. I'm going to container grow it. What do you suggest? I suggest a well draining medium. Um, the, the problem with a lot of the peat based stuff is it tends to get really like airless and then sometimes it goes. You know, it pulls away from the sides of the pot and dries up and you, like you can't hardly get enough water back onto it. You have to put it in a bucket and soak it. Um, so if you can get, if you can get something that's got some larger grit in it, you know, maybe some chopped, smashed rotten wood, you know, mixed in, um, even the little, little tiny bits of gravel. Like look at what some of the bonsai guys do. If you're going to grow a fruit tree in a, in a pot like that, I would look for more of what a bonsai mix would look like because long term that tree's gonna have to live in there way long time and a finer mix may not be the best. So would sorghum syrup work as well as molasses? I I would think so. I can't say for sure. <clears throat> you have to try them side by side. <laughs> Marcus Aurelius says trees you would recommend for high desert, five thousand feet, one minute. I just wrote an article on this and I interviewed a nursery guy in the high desert of New Mexico. One second. If you guys have like, you know, um, sometimes I have answered questions already on, here we go, establishing a high desert food forest that has some suggestions for you. The uh, my website has something like 2,000 posts on it now with a ton of information. I've just gathered information on various plants. And so if you type in like food forest, you'll get 25 articles on food forest and different thoughts on how it works. If you type in yams, you'll get 10 posts or more on yams. Nitrogen fixtures, you'll get lots of posts on it. That's thesurvivalgardener.com. So if, uh, if you, and I, and I post there uh, almost every weekday and sometimes on the weekend too. So there's, there's a ton of info there. If you hit it um, and do a search, search stuff out, you'll find, like if I mentioned chaya, I've got a big plant profile on chaya, Mexican tree spinach. You're like, what's chaya? You know, you can see it. <clears throat> high desert, thumbs down. <laughs> the desert got high, that sounds like drug use to me. High desert, really? I thought you were a Christian. High desert, high desert? Desert, that is high, high desert, high desert, high desert, high. What is the oldest food forest that you have? Uh, nine years. My oldest food forest is nine years. Yeah, black sapote should be okay with a hydrating mix as well. Um, are cardamom leaves edible? <clears throat> Almost certainly all of those gingers are edible. Um, like, like for the ones that you don't even eat the roots, like shell ginger. Um, now watch out because some of the spiral gingers and stuff, this doesn't apply to them. They're actually, they could be outside of the ginger family, but you can take, like we had that false cardamom. We use the leaves. We just rip the leaves and put them in tea. I'm sure the regular cardamom is safe.
Del notices with leaves from a nitrogen fixer. Wait a second. With leaves from a nitrogen fixer, fix more in a compost pile as it jump and draw. Are they equal green or brown? They're mostly green. You'll find they act as the end part of a pile. If you have a stack of brown leaves and you throw in a layer of nitrogen fixing leaves, it'll heat up like crazy because you've given it nitrogen, lots of nitrogen. Because they're nitrogen fixers, I guess it makes sense. Uh, hey Scott, nice to see you. <clears throat> Scott Head, the Black Gumbo Gardener. What is the MPK ratio of poultry manure advantage and disadvantage of it? It's uh, it's very high on the nitrogen end, but um, it's like it's higher than most of them. It's it's a great fertilizer, but it's too hot to use directly unless you're very slightly side dressing it. If you dust a little of it on the ground, you till it under. Uh, you might be okay in a short period of time, but like my uncle once took a half an inch or so and spread it over a garden bed and tilled it under and planted and everything died. It's just too hot. It's better if you can mix it with something that's a little less hot, um, like some, some dried straw and wet it down. If you have like chicken manure and bedding and you wet it down together and make compost out of it, it makes a really good, rich, middle of the road compost. Good job keeping the cardamom alive. I've got a little one. I've got to see if I can get it to go. Um, Finka says, do your fingertips still hurt when you play? Mine hurt like heck after I play. No, not really. I, I've been playing, I play so often, my, my fingertips are hard. And I do get tired playing like complicated bar chords and stuff for a period of time. If I have to play, say, a, a really rocking song on the acoustic where I'm doing a lot of... Because the action is higher and I have to press harder, uh, it'll wear me out over time. It, it's like my, my hand will actually start to feel a little crampy. But... Oh, B. Grum sends a $10 super chat. He says, I just acquired 20 acres into land. I want to build a massive food forest. I don't want to spend more than $1,000 per acre. Any recommendations? Yeah, that's quite doable. I, I recommend that you apply for your nursery license. You set aside a little part as a plant nursery. You apply for your nursery license. And then you go and get accounts with some of the larger nurseries and you buy a lot of your stuff wholesale if you don't want to propagate it yourself. If you have the time to propagate it yourself, you can do it. But you can get trees, and et cetera, for wholesale price instead of retail price. It would make sense if you're going to plant that much space. Get your nursery license even if you don't ever resell anything. It won't cost you that much to get a nursery license. Keep less than a thousand plants in Florida. It's like 25 bucks last last I did it. Uh, and then you could save, I mean, a thousand dollars is, that's a lot of fruit trees. Um, I used to get pear trees for like eight bucks each. So 1,000 divided by eight, that's 125 pear trees. That fills up an acre. 125 fruit trees. So uh, yeah, it's quite possible. That would be my that would be my recommendation. Get your nursery license. It's not that hard. Just work with the wholesales directly. Our gentleman says I have no sound. Got it back. Well, good. That was true. I love when things resolve like that. Thump works. Ha <laughs> ha. Finka says, what is the best time to air layer guava? I can't really tell you. I'm not sure. I I would. Generally, it's better to air layer when the plant is not under a lot of stress. Um, you know, so when it's rainy, but also when it's not actively growing and when it's not hot. So basically in Florida, never. Um, now the downside, guava is not well known uh, as an air layer. It tends to not do 
that well. It tends to have weak root systems if you air layer them or root them from cuttings. So take that for what it's worth. Well, unless you guys have any more questions, I'm going to wrap this sucker up. I, I appreciate you all. I appreciate the super chats. It's great. I haven't done as many of these things lately. I, I met with uh, a friend of mine today. Um, I met with a friend of mine today who is, is helping me plan out the the house we're going to start building very shortly here, so it'll be exciting. Um, but <clears throat> I don't know. I'm not. I don't even know if I'm going to have time to do YouTube stuff while I'm doing all of it because it's just going to be consuming. I have to build as quickly as possible. So. K4LR0B says, David, what do you recommend planting under fruit trees? I like to plant ginger under fruit trees. Um, you can also plant uh, like flowers and lemongrass and herbs. If you plant flowers that bloom a lot and bring in a lot of insect life, that's great. You know, um, because the, then you've always got the insects around the tree and that's what you want. You want a wide variety. You want the pollinators and the bees um, and, and the little little predator insects and stuff. Uh, I also, I like to mulch too, so I mulch and then stick in some, I like to stick herbs underneath them because I figure it confuses pests, but I also like to put flowers in there to attract good insects, so it's, you know, I just mix it up. And I, I put ginger under them usually because the ginger likes a bit of shade in Florida, so. Finka says, awesome progress on the land. Love the new video your wife made. Yes, I, I did that. You guys could see that now. She, she did a, uh, a tour around the land. So you can see. And good work on the land, by the way, uh, Mr. Grum. That's, that's a great deal. 1500 a month for that much land. And the land's a beautiful place, too. Uh, it's, that's, that's, that's gorgeous. Good work. <laughs> 20 acres is a lot of land, though. You know, you may, might make sure that, uh, check and see what species you have available already. You might have some really good stuff out there. You know, there's there's quite a few edible species in Florida, and a lot of them, people, people will just cut down without realizing what they got, you know. <clears throat> All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Remember, if anybody decides to record the... The, I went to see David the Good song. It is C, A minor, F, and G. Make up your own lyrics. It'll be funny. I'll just throw it into the. I'll throw it into my videos. See if you can get me demonetized. No, don't do that. Don't say. Uh, YouTube just came up with a whole new list of stuff they're going to demonetize people for, like having opinions and stuff. So uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see the whole platform go under. <laughs> Uh, also, if you want to see my natural fire ant control video, it is over on my unauthorized.tv. So if you're a subscriber over there, subscribe to unauthorized. That is my backup plan in case YouTube blows. This is, um, this is going to be, this is, this is my backup. And already with you guys supporting me over there, it's, it's, it's catching up to what I make on YouTube. It's ridiculous with how much effort I put into YouTube that I switch over to unauthorized and you guys come and I get like 72, I think I've got 72 subscribers now. It's already catching up to my YouTube revenue. It's ridiculous. <laughs> how much work, how many videos, holy moly. Hey Elizabeth, nice to see you. <clears throat> so anyhow, yeah, that's my natural fire ant control with gasoline, <laughs> the, the permaculture way. So. Thank you guys. Have a great night, and uh, I'm gonna. I've got another video on planting cassava. I'll probably get done tomorrow and put up. But if you haven't seen the, uh, if you haven't seen the video that my wife did showing around the land, it's amazing to see what it looks like after the bobcat has been through. So I've got a friend of mine. We are just going to start building together. We're gonna just start throwing it together. Um, basically sketched out the design and, and he's calling all the people to find out uh, what materials cost. We're going to try and figure out if I can build. I'm going to build basically a uh, like an 800 and something square foot house for 10 people and one on the way. So it's, uh, it's voluntary simplicity and all that jazz. So have a great night and until next time. May your thumbs always be green.